management of uh, uveitis is always challenging uh, because most of the time uh, patients will not have a textbook presentation and uh, uh, similar looking lesions can have different etiologies and uh, same etiology can have different manifestations in different patients so in the next one hour we are going to see some atypical presentations and i am very happy to have dr anuradha vk she is the chief of uveitis department from um, haravindai hospital coimbatore and she will be there as a chief discussion and without any further delay i'm going to the uh, first case and it will be presented by dr sheera kr she is from aradhanai hospital trivandrum she is going to pre present a, a typical presentation of choroiditis over to you sheera okay move on to the first case <coughs> it's about a 32 year old lady who presented with a redness and pain in the right eye uh, which is lasting for around 1 month in the systemic history uh, there was nothing significant and she presented to us after a partial treatment from elsewhere with a topical and also oral steroids left eye was normal and in the right eye her vision at presentation was 6 by 6 and 6 and intraocular pressures were normal her anterior chamber showed 2 plus cells and uh, anterior vitreous phase showed 1 plus cells this was the uh, right eye sorry dilated fundus examination of the right eye in the posterior poll showed hyperemic disc with the blurred disc margins uh, and in the periphery inferior quadrant infrotemporal and the temporal quadrant there was gray white deep retinal lesions uh, and with obscured blood vessels over the lesion which was uh, showing a uh, track like pattern and uh, there was a prominent uh, lesion which was uh, choroidal with a normal overlying blood vessels and uh, we were able to make out a significant amount of vitreitis over these lesions In the right eye OCT scan the fovea was uh, normal there was no macular edema but in the peripheral uh, lesions uh, the sc uh, scan sections through the peripheral lesions showed choroidal involvement and retinal and also overlying vitreous cells this was the uh, ffa picture of the right eye showing hot disc with a disc leak and in the periphery there was uh, hyperfluorescent lesions with minimal uh, vasculitic changes but this ffa was taken actually uh, over a period of uh, after a period of uh, steroid treatment for around one month time because she presented with a history of uh, steroid treatment of uh, one month duration so we considered the possibilities of uh, tuberculosis and as uh, epigenous choroiditis and uh, also uh, dusn also in view of the peripheral lesions uh, tracking like picture and also hot disk and uh, uh, vasculitic changes so we sent all the uh, basic uveitic uh, workup in, uh, investigations and uh, nothing actually made uh, grossly positive in those tests even hrct test was done and physician evaluation done to rule out any underlying tb infectious etiology and also sarcoidosis so uh, the treatment given was we continued with the topical steroids and also midriatics and uh, in view of the dusn we started her on albendazole and after starting albendazole uh, 48 hours later we hiked up the oral steroids she presented with a oral steroid intake of 10 mg vicodin we hiked up into uh, 60 mg after starting 48 hours of albendazole treatment her course in the treatment was uh, uh, immediate follow up after uh, one week time she showed uh, the lesion size was reducing and the lesions got faded and she was showing response to the treatment and symptomatically also she was better and uh, when, but when the vicodin dose tapered to 10 mg she again presented with the uh, uh, symptoms and uh, the lesion size started increasing and also it started uh, moving more posteriorly towards the arcade so we actually referred to a higher center arvindai hospital madurai from there a vitreous biopsy was done and pcr test done the reports came negative for tb hsv vzv and uh, cmv also and uh, again from there uh, she was treated with a oral steroid topical steroids and also a one more course of albendazole on uh, follow up but the lesion was uh, encroaching more towards the macular region with uh, uh, different stages of the lesion in the peripheral uh, there was healed lesions 
and few areas of the active lesion which was extending to the macular region. Uh, the, again, uh, all the blood investigations repeated there and also FFA repeated at the uh, Aravind, uh, which was showing early hypo and late hyper picture. And uh, one year, three months down the line, she again uh, came to us for the further follow-up. That time, uh, this was the fundus picture with all the ma macular region and the posterior pole was involved with the peripheral uh, healed lesions. And in the posterior pole, there was active lesions and the uh, disc was hyperemic and was showing disc edema also. This was the uh, uh, autofluorescence picture and the OCT picture of this uh, uh, late presentation uh, and uh, when uh, she again reviewed at Aravind Hospital, uh, they repeated the PCR test for the same uh, panel, TB, varicella, zoster, herpes simplex and CMV, but all the reports came uh, negative. And uh, uh, they gave uh, one uh, injection of uh, intravitreal steroid also from there and continued with the uh, topical and uh, oral medications, low dose steroids. Thank you, Shira. Over to you, Madam, for discussion. Hello. Um, I think the, uh, can we go back to the second set of pictures? So one thing is, you know, uh, the DUS in, in, in its acute phase, you know, has a clinical picture which is very different from its late phase. It's very important to recognize the USN in the early stages. And the cases which I've seen, you know, they don't get, um, they generally get much smaller lesions, you know, either in clusters or in tracts, okay? It's very unusual for them to get a uh, choroidal elevation like this. So, okay. please go back to the next fundus picture. Yeah, hold it. So in this, if you if you see, you can see that you know the scarring and the edges are active. I would uh, go more in favor of a serpiginous choroiditis in this case. And uh, uh, since the biopsy was negative, the only other thing I might have done is go for a quantiferon TB goal. But I would have gone for immunosuppression in this case. So okay, that's my take. Any role for ATT, madam, here, uh, even though... Um, since the uh, two biopsies were since negative, negative, you know, I would, uh, I would go straight for immunosuppression. Uh, I think they gave intravitreal steroids as well. Yes, yes ma'am. Did that have any positive effect? Yeah, immediately after the injection, uh, she was uh, showing good response and her vision was improving. And all the in, in, infectious uh, evaluation were negative, that's why... Yeah, so even uh, even this uh, so-called tubercular serpiginous uh, choroiditis, you'll see that many of these patients, you know, in spite of ATT and oral steroids, you know, they, they continue to have uh, active inflammation and you need to give them immunosuppression. So that, that's what I think is happening here. Okay. So how frequently, you know, if you're suspecting DVSN and you've actually spotted a worm? Very rare. Very rare. Yeah, so okay. uh, I think over the last one and a half years, you know, we've been uh, doing a series, actually, Dr. Meera has been. So we, we would have seen about six, seven cases. It's more common than you think. And it's one of the most uh, underdiagnosed uh, diagnoses, especially in the acute phase. Okay, it's very commonly mistaken to be either choroiditis. Actually, those lesions are not at the level of choroid. If you run OCT, it's at the outer retina. And... Uh, uh, or, you know, like vasculitis or neuroretinitis. Uh, yeah, so in that, only one one case. Yeah. You better take a fundus photo so that you can spot the worm easily. Yeah, so you, the, the good thing, that's a very good idea because you can blow up the fundus photo and you, uh, the area you need to concentrate. So usually you get a mixture of uh, inactive and active lesions and you need to look for the worm near the active lesions. Okay, so you can blow it up and try to look for it. We have done that, but in spite of it, only one in six, seven, it's very rare. But beautiful response to a combination of albendazole and steroids. Would some other imaging modality help in locating the OCT by the OCT? No. And this photo will be the best, yeah, I think. I think. Even I agree with that. 
I don't know whether other modality as in rate free or something, you know, would be more useful. I'm not very, yeah, not very sure, but fund us for it as well. And Madam, uh, tell a uh, few clues how to go further when you suspect whether it is choroiditis or chorioretinitis. Uh, what, uh, can you give a clue uh, how to go further? Uh, so first of all, you know, it's important to know the level of the lesion, whether it's uh, retinitis, choroiditis, or chorioretinitis. You'll all know how, how to differentiate it clinically. You, you know, the retinitis is more white in color with less defined margin. They look like large cotton wool spots. You can see the vessels passing through the lesion and you get more of vitritis and uh, hemorrhages as well. Whereas choroiditis tend to be more yellow. Um, if you look at the lesion, you can see the blood vessels are passing over the lesion, as you can see in the photograph here. Uh, more defined margins and um, vitritis and hemorrhages are less common. So. Once you know what it is, you know, the thing to do is to decide whether it's an infectious or non-infectious uh, condition. In general, in real life, most retinitis is infectious. So this is something you need to keep in mind. Most retinitis is infectious until otherwise proven. Whereas choroiditis, it could be 50-50. Yeah. So um, retinitis, it tends to be more of toxo and viral. And uh, choroiditis, I think... TB and Sarkot. Okay, thank you, Madam. Next, I invite Dr. Anju Kuryakos to present her case of Kori endophthalmitis. Dr. Anju Kuryakos, she is a UVA consultant, Chaitanya Eye Hospital and Western Eye Hospital, Kuchi. Good afternoon to one and all present here. Uh, thank you, KSOS, for this opportunity. I am Dr. Anju Kregos. I am going to present an interesting case. So, a 30-year-old male presented with complaints of blurring of vision in his right eye for the past two days. No history of pain, redness, watering, photophobia. No relevant past history. No history of uh, uh, trauma or no comorbidities, not on any medications. On systemic examination, he uh, is conscious oriented with the norm, vitals were within normal limits. On ophthalmic examination, best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was 6'9, uh, left eye was 6'6, and his segment and IOP were within normal limits. On fundus examination, uh, right eye uh, dilated fundus examination, media haze was noted, and multiple yellow fluffy uh, round lesions were noted in the superior uh, along the superior arcade. And rest of the retina was within normal limits. Left eye fundus examination was within normal limits. On further investigation. Uh, we ran the OCT on the lesion, on the uh, lesion uh, which was on the superior uh, arcade. Uh, on the lesion showed hyperreflectivity of the inner retina with posterior shadowing along with vitreous aggregates, with vitreous aggregates extending into the vitreous cavity. This is another uh, picture showing again the uh, OCT running on the lesion. So we sent the patient for a UVA panel of investigation, out of which uh, HbA1c was 8.5 and deranged uh, blood sugar levels. Rest of the investigations with within normal limits. On probing on the history, uh, because he is not aware of his diabetic status, on he was given a history of native treatment for his varicose vein, which includes maybe uh, he's uh, doubting of including steroids in that. So urgent physician referral was sent for systemic control and was started on topical one-person oriconazole therapy. He was reviewed after a week. Uh, his vision was still the same, but on OCTs, uh, but his uh, lesions were uh, seemed to be resolving. So we, went, we ran the OCT on the lesion again, which was previously. We could see the uh, significant difference of the hyperreflectivity of the inner retina was significantly decreased with this vitreous aggregates. So this is the picture with uh, first presentation of OCT showing the typical hyperreflective lesion on the inner retina with vitreous aggregates extending into the vitreous cavity. And this is the second one. The first presentation which is uh, hyperreflective lesion, uh, lesion which is termed as rain cloud sign. 
so provisional diagnosis of endogenous endo, uh, candida endophthalmitis was made because rain cloud sign in OCT is typical of candida, candida specific which was uh, published previously in 2018. So take home messages, rain cloud sign in the OCT uh, is candida specific, appropriate investigation can clinch the diagnosis because when we ran the OCT on the lesion, we could see the picture of the rain cloud, typical rain cloud sign which gave the final diagnosis for this patient. Thank you. Inverted, inverted snowing sign that was actually in a photo essay recently published because they were feeling if we, uh, I have pictures on that. I will not open it. Uh, I have pictures for that. So this was the first uh, picture, uh, first sign which was published in 2018. And this was the photo essay we were mentioning. And in that, in the inside picture, you can see it is inverted. They have inverted the image and they have mentioned about this inverted sewing sign. This is that photo essay. And one more uh, thing is there, where is one, uh, they had one classification for this. There are four types on that. I think Madam will discuss more about it. <laughs> On fundus examination, what are the typical things that we are looking out in a case of fungal endophthalmitis? Um, I actually have to say that, you know, history is actually key, you know, rather than examination. And particularly in endogenous uh, fungal endophthalmitis, uh, more than the uh, clinical examination, it's the history that gives you a clue. And uh, with fungal, you know, so, so you, you when you started the presentation, you... Uh, put it as a healthy patient, uh, but this patient turned out to be a diabetic. Yes, and and uh, not to be taken lightly, uncontrolled diabetes is probably the yes, most the common risk factor for endogenous. And if I would like to repeat it, uncontrolled diabetes is the most common risk factor. Okay, You tend to think that an uh, endogenous end of patient is going to be a very sick patient, you know, admitted in IC. That's not the case. And uh, with fungal uh, endophthalmitis, you also have to ask for history which dates few months uh, prior to the onset. So any kind of ocular inflammation which happens in a patient after hospitalization, after some kind of surgical intervention, particularly notorious in the GIT or urinary tract. Those two areas, you know, typically causes a, a fungal, fungemia, to say, so to say. Uh, it can have, it, you know, it can be few months prior to it. So you need to ask, you know, what happened in the few months preceding the onset of the eye symptoms. So you're not asking for a history, you know, one month ago, two months ago. This is exactly the, you know, how you need to take the history. Uh, then, you know, you need to, you know, any inflammation, you know, after a hospitalization or any kind of intervention, you know, you need to think of uh, endogenous and of. In the... Um, uh, in the fundus findings, we actually are post COVID. Uh, we we saw a lot of uh, fungal, uh, um, you know, and yeah, uh, end of thalmitis. And uh, typically, you know, they can have these snowballs in the vitreous. So some of these cases, you know, they look like um, toxo, but uh, the presence of snowballs is is a clue that would f uh, favor, you know, go in favor of fungal. Um, Similarly, that kind of uh, pre-retinal aggregates in uh, rain cloud sign. And also, you know, classically, you know, what happens is the uh, infection comes into the choroid, it breaks through into the retina and then comes out into the vitreous. So if you do an OCT, you can see that it's like a volcanic eruption, you know. Like you can see the scone, you know, coming up like that. So these are all uh, features, you know, which should make you think about uh, fungal endogenous end of uh, end of thalmitis. So you can mistake it for intermediate uveitis. So that's that's one differential diagnosis you should keep in mind. But intermediate uveitis will not have a retinochoroidal lesion. Uh, yeah. Was any blood or urine culture done here, uh, or AC uh, vitreous biopsy? No. Within one, one after one week, patient loss follow. Okay. Only then because we don't have follow up after one week. 
Madam, if you have a case of endogenous, uh, you're suspecting a fungal endorph, uh, would you start a systemic antifungals and give an intrauterial voriconazole? Uh, yeah, so no, normally, you know, the thing is, you know, we, we would refer them to retina department, but we have managed uh, some of the milder ones with oral uh, fluconazole with, this is the candida and no end of, with excellent results. Um, but you have to give it, you know, for a couple of months, two months. It's also very important, you know, although uh, most of the time the blood and urine culture, all, you know, almost always comes negative because the, the seeding would have happened, you know, months ago. But nevertheless, for le legal uh, reasons, you should do blood and urine culture in all these cases and uh, control the systemic risk factors. Yeah. Uh, most of them had, uh, yeah, high sugars. Or most of them did. Or they were hospitalized. They had, you know, steroids during that time. Yeah. Madam, when to suspect an infectious etiology uh, when you are treating a uveitis, considering it as an immune pathology? Uh, when will you suspect an infectious etiology, especially end of? So, to answer that kind of briefly, any patients whose immunity is compromised, either from HIV or iatrogenically, if the patient is on immunosuppression, any inflammation in that patient, any uveitis, is to be considered infectious until otherwise proven, okay? Um, that is one. Two is, like I said, any inflammation whose onset is after surgery or in hospitalization. So this could be an ocular surgery or it could be some surgery in the body or any kind of uh, IV fluid or hospitalization. Anything which has started after that, you need to think of it as infectious. And uh, generally, like I said, most uh, retinitis, you know, you would, you would consider infectious. Any hyperpion uveitis, again, you know, you need to to rule out infection, you know, before. So these are my top four. Uh, thank you, Anju. As we move on to the next case, uh, I welcome um, uh, Dr. Neetu Pradeep. Uh, she is a uh, retina and uvia consultant at Amardeep Eye Care Column. She will be presenting a case on mortal masquerades. Good afternoon to all. I thank KSOs, Risha Madam and Rajasri Madam for giving me an opportunity to present this IC. Moving on to my case. The case of a 25-year-old young male who presented to an outside local hospital with history of defective vision in the right eye over the past two weeks. It was a painful defective vision. He also gives a history of recent onset V's for past one week, no history of any other systemic illness, no addictions. Based on all records, his best corrected visual acuity was 66 six parts in the right eye and left eye examination was within normal limit and fundus in right eye was recorded as disc edema. From the local hospital, he was advised neurophthal opinion and an MRI brain and orbit was done from the hospital which showed subretinal sub soft tissue lesion with fluid around the optic disc and normal brain study. When he presented to us, three days later, his best corrected visual acuity was 636 in the right eye and left eye vision was 66. Anterior segment examination revealed nasal episcleral congestion. And his uh, anterior chamber was quiet, IOP was 16 millimeter mercury in the uh, right eye, left eye examination was within normal limit. Fundus examination of right eye showed disc edema extending to the peripapillary area, surface hemorrhages on the disc, subretinal fluid surrounding the disc with venous tortuosity. The peripheral examination of right eye was within normal limit, left eye, left eye was completely normal. B scan of the right eye showed RCS thickening around the optic nerve head. OCT in the juxtapapillary area shows choroidal elevation, subretinal fluid, shytic intraretinal edema. OCT disc confirmed the above findings. Basic blood investigation was given for the patient. His ESR was found to be normal. However, Manto came to be positive. So we did an HRCT test which showed fibrocavitary changes in right upper lobe with patchy pneumonitis changes suggestive of all pulmonary tuberculosis. A FFA ICG was also done for this patient which showed block fluorescence correspond to the hemorrhages with increase in fluorescence and late phase disc leak. At this point of time, our provisional diagnosis was ocular tuberculosis. We started the patient on topical steroids. However, patient also gives a, also had a history of two to three episode of hemoptysis. So we referred the patient to the pulmonologist who initiated ATT and steroids. 
and he also the patient also underwent bronchoalveolar leverage which later came positive for which later came negative for mycobacterium tuberculosis Three weeks later, patient came to us with severe pain in the right eye. At this time, his best character visual acuity has dropped to 5 by 60. The nasal episcleral congestion was persisting and the fundus picture almost remained the same. When we pondered the history, we came to know that he was continuing the oral steroid, uh, he was continuing the ATT, but he discontinued the systemic steroids. So we restarted him on IV steroids, but the pain got completely relieved, but there was no improvement in vision. The current scenario is that the ocular symptoms are currently uh, completely relie relieved, but there was no visual improvement. And we did a repeat investigation which showed deranged LFT. At this time, the patient started developing pleuritic chest type of chest pain along with breathlessness. So at this point, we had a second thought that we should whether we should revise our diagnosis. So we sent the patient again back to the pulmonologist. So the pulmonologist had advised repeat investigation and they did a repeat HRCT which showed well-defined heterogeneous lesion in the cardiophrenic angle. They, this was a lesion which appeared smaller and solid on prior CT and they, uh, and they re, uh, reported it as evolving abscess with infiltration and they reported multiple nodular opacities in bilateral lung field which was a new finding and they suggested biopsy in view of a possibility of fungal or tubercular etiology and patient was referred to a higher center. When the patient came to us with this report, his best corrected visual acuity has further dropped to 1 by 60. Patient had marked episcleral congestion, pupil has developed RAPD and the fundus picture was showing extensive exudative RD with worsening of the peripapillary region and the biopsy patient underwent biopsy from the right cardiophrenic angle mass which showed a moderately differentiated cardio, uh, adenocarcinoma. The patient underwent metastatic workup which, which showed an increase in size of cardiophrenic angle lesion, presence of multiple pulmonary nodules, metabolically active mediastinal and hilar lymph nodes and iliac meds. Even though the patient was initiated on chemotherapy, on further follow up we came to know that the patient expired. So the take home message is that even though uveitis is an initial presentation of metastatic cancer is a rare entity, we should have a high index of suspicion whenever there is poor response to a normal conventional treatment. Thank you. Thank you, Neetu. Uh, madam, uh, what do you feel was it uh, only a TB manifestation or TB later came to be a masquerade? Or was it only a masquerade? Uh, a, a lot of, uh, you know, uh, misleading findings here. You know, one is the age, 25 years old, uh, starting with 6'6 six, six vision in spite of, you know, having the disc edema and the peripapillary involvement, episcleral congestion. Um, so very difficult, you know, to think of uh, metastasis, but they do that. You know, very rarely um, tumors can incite a lot of inflammation. So it's uncommon. You generally think of metastasis as, you know, painless, you know, a quiet eye, but once in a blue moon they can do that. So um, so I think it might have been uh, just, the, just the meds uh, all along the way. I just wanted to know the primaries in the lung or elsewhere? No, primary was in the lung, ma'am. Was in the lung. I didn't because, know customer. Yeah, because we, 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 a few years ago, we had a preg pregnant lady. That uh, lady was, I uh, think, in her last trimester of pregnancy. Comes with recurrent episcleral congestion and uh, orangish-looking mass and uh, subretinal exudates. Okay? Really fluffy, white-looking exudates and SRF. So she underwent a vitreous biopsy given intrauterial antibiotic. She improved. The, the subretinal exudates actually improved. Uh, and because she was pregnant, you know, she refused to undergo a radiological evaluation. And, then, and Manto was positive. So she was started on uh, ATT and oral steroids uh, with no improvement. And then she was following up locally in Calicut. And then uh, her situation was sent, and then they picked up, you know, after she delivered, they did a HRCT chest. It was a metastatic carcinoma. 
the, the that kind of subretinal fluffy exudates I've never seen in a mat. It it looked infectious, um, and the primary was in the breast. Yeah, so uh, once in a blue moon that can happen. And uh, TB probably, you know, this, I think there are articles, you know, where mm -hmm. TB is a very common thing which is mistaken for meds and vice versa. Yeah, thank you, Nidhu. And uh, Madam, uh, in our common practice, when, uh, in which all situations you suspect masquerades? Because it's life-saving, no? So, um, the two things, you know, which uh, you, somebody who is uh, seeing uveitis patient is likely to come up with is the um, primary intraocular lymphoma, which, the, and the two common presentations of uh, primary intraocular lymphomas, it can present as vetritis, so you might mistake it for an intermediate uveitis, or it can present with these what you think is a choroidal lesion, it's not a choroidal lesion, it's actually a sub-RP lesion or retinal infiltrates. If you run the OCT through it, the primary vitreo retinal lymphoma, like the name says, you know, it affects the vitreous and the retina, not the choroid. Okay, so run an OCT through it. Typically, they have that leopard spot uh, appearance. Those lesions will have that uh, leopard spot kind of appearance. So um, <coughs> these cases, Again, uh, older patients, you know, suddenly presenting with de novo uh, inflammation and not responding to uh, steroid therapy, you should always keep that in mind. The second one is your solid lesions. Yeah. The uh, solid meds, you know, you can confuse it with uh, choroidal granuloma. Once again, the color is a little bit different. The choroidal granulomas tend to be more yellowish, whereas this one, again, you know, Typically, they can be uh, either like amelanotic lesions or they can have the second spotty appearance. And the FFA is also different. In granuloma, you'll get an early hypo and later the le entire lesion will become hyper. Whereas uh, in, in mats, you know, you'll see that pinpoint hyperfluorescence, which is persisting until the late stage. Even when the entire lesion is taking up fluorescence, you know, that pinpoint hyperfluorescence will remain in a mat. Yeah. And as a part of paraneoplastic syndromes, especially in uh, lung carcinoma, I can have some sort of inflammation. I have seen one case presenting as neuro optic neuritis like picture in a case of uh, CA. Lung. Yeah, so the, then again, you know, uh, you, you have to keep that in mind, you know, when you're seeing uh, uh, unexplained vision loss and extremes of age. And uh, you have this uh, autoimmune retinopathy, which again can be a parane paraneoplastic. So you have to, you know, sudden loss of vision, very extensive outer retinal uh, layer lo loss, you know, you might have to look for occult malignancies. The take home message is whenever you treat a case of uveitis and uh, the inflammation is not resolving as you expect or it recur again and again, you have to revise your diagnosis. Either you might be missing some inf infection or uh, rule out masquerades, always. Okay. Next, I invite Dr. Rajasri Nambiar uh, to present a case of again suspected. Uh, choroiditis. She is from Little Flower Hospital, Angamali. Over to you, Rajshri. Mm, thank you all. Uh, as I, I begin with my case, the relentless march of the bug. Uh, this is the story of a 62-year-old female with no comorbidities. Uh, she was a vegetarian, no history of any pets. She was referred to us as a case of left eye panubiitis. She had a history of left eye cataract surgery in 2018. And then she presented one month ago to a local hospital where, uh, with defective vision where a uvia workup was done and uh, she was diagnosed to have CME and a posterior subtenon strikeout injection was given. Now this is the right eye which was normal. Coming to the left eye, her vision was 3 by 60. She had granulomatous KPs with 2 plus cells and PCIOL. Uh, coming to the examination of the fundus, the media was very hazy due to vitritis. The disc 
could be seen very hazily. You could see a sclerosed vessel superotemporally. There were areas of large areas of retinitis seen superotemporally at the macula and also nasally. We had a provisional diagnosis of viral retinitis and toxoplasma retinitis. This patient had been evaluated at the local hospital. Her investigations showed toxo IgG showed a threefold rise in titus. IgM was negative, MAN2 was negative, VDRL HIV was negative. So we started our treatment with tab valsevir, 1 gram TID, along with azithromycin, visalone, and topical medications. The next day, we took her for an AC tap, and the sample was sent for PCR for toxo and the viral genomes. The result came positive on the third day for toxoplasma and negative for the virals. So we stopped Valsevir and started her on tap bactrim DS, uh, one BD, along with oral visalone, and we also gave an injection of intravitreal uh, clindamycin and dextamethasone. Now this patient, one week later, she presented to us. The vitritis had reduced. We could see the disc, which was more pale. We could see the retinitis patches. The uh, edges seemed to be more defined, though there was a large lesion at the macula. Now she came back to us after two weeks. We again gave a repeat intravitreal clindamycin and dexa injection. Now uh, this was a picture after her second dose. Two weeks later, she again came back to us. She had severe steroid intolerance. So we tapered her oral steroids to 10 milligram, and uh, we asked her to continue tap back from DS. We advised her to take a repeat injection, but she refused. Again, two weeks later, she came back with severe pain and redness. At this moment, she had severe amount of anterior chamber reaction with the three plus cells, and the vitritis had increased. This was her picture at presentation. There was severe vitritis. Again, everything looked hazy. So we started, we hiked up our oral steroids. We gave a repeat injection of intravitreal clindamycin with DEXA. We stopped Patron DS and started her on tap clindamycin. Uh, and then she followed up after one month. Her vision was now only hand movements. Now this is her picture after one month. Uh, again, details, uh, everything looked very hazy. Uh, the retinit retinitis patches, the patch of the macula, always still present. So uh, at this moment, we decided we need to revise our diagnosis. We advised the patient to go in for a vitrectomy and again a repeat PCR. But by then, the patient, I think, uh, she decided to go elsewhere. And then we did not have any other follow-ups. So this is uh, the summary of our case at first presentation, following her first injection. And this is after stopping her steroids. Um, so now my, I had a lot of uh, doubts in this case. So uh, first, could this be toxoplasma? Are we looking at viral retinitis? Why did the PCR come negative? Because she was an immunocompetent lady. The only thing was she was given oral steroids, I mean intra, uh, posterior subtenant steroids. So the PSG was given for cystoid macular yeah, cystoid macular Yeah, so the thing is, you know, if you don't do a careful indirect, you can very easily miss uh, lesions in the back of the eye. And if you give PSG, you, you know, then you can have, a, you know, very atypical presentation. Um, I assume that HIV was negative. Negative. HIV was negative. TPHA was negative. Negative. VDR. Yeah. Neg so the, the, you, you got to remember that once you give PST, you know, the effect is going to be there for a while. It's going to be there for six to eight weeks. So, uh, you know, until the effect wears off, you know, you, you're going to, I think people have even uh, reported scleral necrosis uh, in toxoplasma after PST. So, but you can see that, you know, after you started clindamycin injection, there is a response. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, um, sometimes what happens is, you know, large lesions like this, they, uh, they take a long time to respond. And uh, um, you also see situations where, where you have large lesions, you know, where it will partly respond and then will not budge. Okay, no matter what you give, you can give bactrim, clindamycin injections, you know, it will stay as it is. So the, the only thing to do then is to go for a vitrectomy. Yeah. So I, I still think it could be toxo. Um, 
Was there a scarred lesion no, in the macula? Find, no, no. There was a, like, do you have any OCT? Yeah, the that was a, like, you know, we, we did not have OCT. You need to run OCT. I, I find OCT very helpful in differentiating uh, lymphoma from, yeah. uh, you know, other retinitis because the OCT in lymphoma typically will show a sub-RP deposit. In the early stages, it will look like drusen. Yeah. So you should not go for areas which are very elevated because of the shadowing you will not see. So try to look for flatter lesions, uh, you know, which are in the middle. So try to uh, get an imaging, you will get a better idea of what it is. Retinal infiltrates can happen in, uh, in lymphoma as well, yeah. but choroidal involvement, no. But that will happen in toxo. Toxo can have, you know, large lesions like this, you know, they will be choroidal involvement. So you feel, madam, you feel it as a uh, peripheral toxo and flared up due to the uh, septinone. Yeah. yeah. When you are in doubt, madam, uh, do you give, I mean, Valsevir along with Bactrim DS because there was always a doubt whether we are looking at a viral or a toxo. Yeah, when, uh, when you look at the initial phase, there's absolutely no problem in giving, you know, until you know one way or the other, you can give Valsevir plus back room. And I tell my patients as well, you know, it could be this, it could be this as well, so I'm going to give you both. Okay. And once I have the biopsy results back, I'll decide, you know, what to continue. So no harm in doing that. And uh, how reliable is uh, Toxo PCR? Very, Very extremely reliable, provided you do it in a good lab. Any PCR is only as good as a lab which does it. But PCR in uh, uveitis, I think, you know, is best for toxoplasma and virus. Viruses. viruses. These days, we are getting few false positive viral PCR. Which one? Cytomegalo? No, no. HSV. HSV. So, um, always... QTB, false positive. False positive. You always have to do a clinical correlation. There's, there's no uh, getting over it, you know, like, you always have to correlate clinically. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Registry. And the take-home message here is, before giving, uh, especially local steroids like intravitreal or uh, uh, periorbital, uh, periocular steroids, rule out infection, uh, especially peripheral tox or viral lesion. That is very important. Okay. Uh, last, I invite Dr. Anuradha VK for her keynote address on immunosuppressives in uveitis. After hearing all infectious uveitis, <laughs> uh, she will give a talk on immunosuppressives in uveitis. Uh, thank you, Dr. Risha, Dr. Rajshri, Dr. Srini, and the rest of the organizing team of Drishti 2023 for having me here to talk on immunosuppressives in UVI. It is very ironic you now after discussing a lot of infections. So we all know that uh, in non-infectious uveitis, steroids are still the first line of treatment because they act very quickly and they work across a spectrum of disorders, okay? Uh, but we also know that, you know, steroids often, and they are not very good at controlling inflammation adequately. And you also got to remember that the patient who comes to see you with uveitis is not looking just to get rid of the disease. They want to be free of the drug as well. So th this, this term called remission, you know, where the patient has no uveitis and is drug free for three months, that is the goal. I think that should be the goal. So which patients need immunosuppression? So it could depend on the nature of the uveitis. And you have the first set of uh, uh, indications, which I would call the primary uh, indication for a primary immunosuppression. So by that, what you mean is, as soon as you're sure of your diagnosis, you're sure this patient has this particular entity, you're going to start them on immunosuppression along with high dose oral steroids. And right at the top of the list is Bechet's disease, followed by sympathetic ophthalmia, and necrotizing scleritis with or without PUK in granulomatosis polyangitis or rheumatoid arthritis. I will also include selected cases of immune-mediated serpiginous choroiditis and selected cases of VKH, which we can open up for discussion later. 
Now coming to the next set, it's, you know, you have a recurrent uh, inflammation as in the case of HLA B27 uveitis or a chronic uveitis associated with JIA, you should uh, go for early immunosuppression. Uh, our next set of indications come from response to treatment, or I should say lack of response to treatment. And whenever you are moving from steroids to immunosuppression, for that matter, anytime you are escalating dose or changing medication in uveitis, there are three things you need to rule out. One is com non-compliance, non-adherence -ad to treatment, infection, and masquerade. So what do you mean by lack of response to steroid? So if a patient has been on high dose steroid for about four weeks or you know in a dose more than 30 mg is not adequate to control inflammation as in this case with a bilateral retinal vasculitis. You need to add IMS and you can see the improvement after adding methotrexate. The second indication is, okay, you started uh, high dose steroids, started at 60, patient is doing well, you managed to taper it down to 20, patient has a reactivation, you discuss, you hiked it back to 40, you again taper it to 15, you have another reactivation. So if you need more than 7.5 milligrams of steroid to control inflammation for more than three months, once again, you need to add immunosuppressive to try um, either to take them off the steroids completely, which is the goal, and I think it's one of the important steps for inducing remission, or to keep it at 7.5 milligram or below, because that's the dose that's considered to be safe for intermediate use. But as you can see from this article, you know, the cumulative dose of prednisolone also matters, okay? So you want to try and take them off steroids if possible. Uh, I don't think I need to go into details about side effects and intolerance. I just want to tell you intolerance is what the patient feels subjectively. Uh, it's very important to take into account because that's one of the causes for non-compliance. And generally, you know, if I look at my patients, uh, my patients who are on high-dose steroids are generally unhappy patients. The moment you manage to reduce them to below 10 or put them on just IMS alone, they feel much better. So IMS is much bet better tolerated than steroids. So once you have decided that a particular uh, condition patient needs immunosuppression, the decision to start the immunosuppressive and you know the kind of immunosuppressive you need to start should be the result of a open uh, discussion with the patient as well as with the family. And you need to explain to them why you need, you know, you need to start them on IMS. The duration of treatment, because it's very long, it's around about two to three years, okay? You also need to assess the fitness for immunosuppression and advise them regarding very strict follow-up and the uh, do's and do's. So the fitness has two components. The first part is the history, um, where you want to rule out past history of tuberculosis, any ongoing active systemic infection or any recent infections. Um, you also want to rule out any major systemic uh, illnesses like, you know, liver problem, kidney problem, heart problem, any history of malignancy. And if they are in the child uh, bearing group, you know, you want to rule out their pregnant or a female patient, you want to rule out pregnancy and uh, whether they are breastfeeding. And you also need to ask them whether they will be willing to postpone having another child for the duration of treatment, you know. So, um, so these are the things you need to roughly go through. So I, for starting non-alkylating uh, antimetabolites, I do complete blood count, SCOT, SCPT, creatinine, MANTO, chest X-ray, TRIDOT, which is uh, HIV, HS, HBSAG, HCV, BP and sugar. And in the rare case where I start cyclophosphamide, I will do urine for RBC as well. Um, this is a list of the most commonly used um, conventional and, you know, immunosuppressives in uveitis. I'm not going to go into details. You can uh, read them from any standard textbook. I just want to tell that if you ask the one, one medicine I go to, it is methotrexate. So once you start them on this medication, they are followed up after two weeks. Uh, you repeat complete blood count, SCOT, SCVT, creatinine. 
uh, BP and blood sugar. And then they're seen after one month, and then one and a half months, two months, until they are stabilized, and I'm sure that they are responding to the immunosuppression, and thereafter, for the rest of the course of treatment, they will be seen every three months, along with the lab workup. So a few things I want to tell you about using immunosuppression for controlling uveitis. Uh, most of the, uh, the conventional uh, non-alkylating uh, antimetabolites, they work very slowly. They take two to three months to act. So very important that you cover with adequate steroids during that period. You know? So the dose of steroid will depend on you know, how severe the inflammation is. And you have to taper the steroids slowly. Otherwise, you will get a reactivation. So you can start with a smaller dose of uh, IMS and escalate the dose if needed. If one immunosuppressive is not working, it's best to switch to another immunosuppression. So like I said, the goal is to go for a steroid-free remission and thereafter hold non-alkylating agents for two years. And if it's an alkylating agent, you have to hold them for one year. So it's, it's the, the time is of essence to induce remission. So although immunosuppressives, they, they really have made a difference in the management. As you can see from this data here, okay, this is the one-year steroid sparing success of the commonly used uh, conventional immunosuppressive. At best, it's around 60%, okay? So that, mean, that means about 40 to 45% of the patients don't achieve a control with IMS and 10 milligram or more of steroids. That's what it means. And this is taken from the site study. So you have the next class of uh, immunosuppressives named biologicals. Once again, I'm not going to go into theory. You might know that uh, the adalimumab injection is probably the most popular biologic that's available now. It's a TNF-alpha inhibitor. It's given subcutaneously uh, every one to two weeks. Only problem with uh, the injection is it's expensive. I also want to mention rituximab, which is uh, very useful in scleritis, especially in uh, granulomatosis, polyangitis, orbital inflammation, and uh, PUK. So the most common indications for uh, switching to biologicals is Bechet's disease, uh, JI, and seronegative spondyloarthropathies, and you usually You'll find that rheumatologists use uh, adalimumab along with methotrexate. So in addition to the side effects of uh, conventional immunosuppressives, you need to watch out for reactivation of tuberculosis, a worsening of multiple sclerosis, and congestive heart failure with the TNF-alpha inhibitors. I just want to speak briefly on tofacitinib. It's a Janus kinase inhibitor and uh, is showing very promising results in refractory uveitis and scleritis. Even those which have failed to respond to adalimumab have personal experience as well. Very affordable and it's available in the tablet form as doses five to 10 milligrams per day. Um, so in addition to the risk of opportunist infection, some of the studies says that you know there's an increased risk of pulmonary embolism. Not all studies, not all reviews agree with it and a slightly increased risk of malignancy. But this one, you know, probably I think will replace adalimumab. That's, that's my feeling. So I just want to end with this, uh, this patient. This is this, uh, one of my patients who's been following up for the past 10 years. He was already diagnosed by shits, you know, when he first came in 2013. Left eye had 624 vision. Right eye had 6, six vision. He failed to respond to methotrexate max dose. As a thiaprine, he couldn't tolerate. Put him on cyclophosphamide, and he developed a subretinal lesion. You know, so I was worried about whether it's TB, so I stopped cyclophosphamide. He was st still on 30 mg oral steroids, advised with biopsy. Overnight, his vision went from 662 to 2 by 60. After that, he was referred to a rheumatologist. He was put on infleximab, adalimumab, had a very stormy course. He was in ICU a couple of occasions. And after they stabilize, he is on triple immunosuppression, azathioprine, cyclosporin, and Vicelon. And this is his right eye today. I saw him this week as well. He's that 6'9 vision in that eye. 
uh, and I, every time I look at him, I tell him, you know, I think you're a miracle, a miracle that would not have been possible without use of immunosuppression and biologicals. Thank you very much. And this is the suggested reading. Uh, thank you, ma'am, for your talk. Uh, any questions for madam from the audience? I think uh, no questions. Okay. Uh, before we wind up the session, may I request Dr. Risha to hand over a moment to, to Anuradha, madam. I thank all the audience for their presence. Thank you, madam, for the talk.